Waterdale Baptist Church. Good to see everyone today. Uh, turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 20. Um, Acts chapter 20, and uh, we'll start verse 17. Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And, uh, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, and he called the elders of the church. When they were coming to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptation which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how by I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shown you, and have taught publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, say, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I may finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. We'll go ahead and uh, pray here. Dear God, thank you for your word, for the many good things you've given us. Help us, please, live in light of the truth you've given us, and help us, please, live for you with the time we have here on this earth to serve you more than anything, and to love you more than anything, to set our affection on things above and not on things on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, here we have in the uh, book of Acts an account uh, by the Apostle Paul. He is, uh, this is the end of what they'd like to call his third missionary journey, and uh, so he is basically... <coughs> Coming toward the end of this journey, he's been spending kind of a while in different places. He spent, uh, I think, close to three years in Corinth. He spent uh, over three years in the city of Ephesus. And he's sailing back towards Jerusalem. He's knowing what's about to befall him in Jerusalem. He knows it's going to be a hard time when he gets there. But he he's, feels bound in the Holy Spirit that he's supposed to go there to Jerusalem. He knows things are going to be rough. He stops by at these people at, uh, at uh, Ephesus. And he meets the elders here. He knows he's not going to see these elders again. And uh, he knows that the time is coming where he's going to be going to Jerusalem. So he kind of gives them a farewell speech, if you will, in a sense. Something for us all to consider is we do not know how much longer we have on this earth. Uh, the Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for now thou knowest not what the day may bring forth. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, is what the Bible says. Uh, uh, the sufficient of the day is the evil thereof. That's something Jesus said in the New Testament. First one, that's Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Today is sufficient for us, but um, because of that, how we live our life today ought to matter. Um, supposing you were going to give a farewell address, what would it be? Well, the Apostle Paul's farewell address here, it's uh, very interesting what he says here. Um, he talks about finishing his course with joy and um, basically uh, the Apostle Paul the reason he's finishing his course with joy is because he has lived his life for Christ now he is um, did Paul always live perfectly most certainly not was all of Paul's Christian life a very successful Christian witness well there was a period for I don't know probably five to ten years where Paul was in the city of Tarsus, he kind of got kicked out of uh, Syria by the Christians and by the unbelievers alike. They were happy when he left. And um, he, uh, so he, he ended up in Tarsus. And um, I, for a period of maybe five, ten years, he wasn't really doing even a whole lot necessarily. I don't know what he was doing there. But the um, Bible doesn't really say one way or the other. And, uh, he wasn't really reinstated into ministry until Barnabas came by and grabbed him. Barnabas really had quite a ministry you find in the book of Acts of finding struggling believers who once lived for Christ, finding them, grabbing them, and getting them back to being useful. He got Paul to being useful. He got uh, John Mark to being useful again. And um, anyway, here uh, we, we find Paul ending his course here with these people, and he's done it with joy. And uh, the question you should ask yourself is... Have I lived for Christ? Am I living for Christ now? Um, something it says in the book of Revelation, it's important 
for the uh, last things to be better than the first. Now, in other words, you keep on growing and you keep on going further. Sometimes you find yourself backsliding, sometimes you find yourself struggling, but it's important when you find yourself struggling to keep on going further and uh, to reignite your passion for Christ, to uh, set your affection back on the things above, to uh, love Christ more and more. Um, it's natural for us, after we make a uh, great stride for godliness, sometimes forget some of the things we've done, some of the things we've learned, and to backslide. To fall sometimes back into the things we once did, and to uh, perhaps damage ourselves with the things which once troubled us. And so when we find ourselves in these things, it's important for us to strive again forward for Christ. It's important for us to consider our life what it is and where we are, that we might finish our course with joy. Uh, book of Philippians, um, chapter 3. Apostle Paul says this, uh, verse 7, But what things were gained for me, those I counted loss for Christ? Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, being found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the uh, faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of the faith of God, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. By any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And uh, he goes on to say, so here, here he is saying what he wants his life to be all about, all the things which were gained to him, he's counted them lost for Christ. They're worthless to him now. They're useless. And uh, he's, his goal is to live for Christ not to glorify himself with his life now, but to glorify God. As it says in uh, all things, whatsoever you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And he says this, uh, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And this is what the Christian life is really all about, is knowing Christ. When you know Christ, it will help you make the right choices on a day-to-day basis. The Bible does not tell us... Um, all kinds of things. There's so many things the Bible can't tell us what exactly to do. Um, the Bible doesn't mention anything about uh, cars. It doesn't mention anything about computers. It doesn't mention any kind of thing about all these things. But I'll tell you, the Bible does have a whole lot of things which tell us how we ought to live and uh, all kinds of um, things which teach us how we ought to serve God. And so there's a lot of things we need great wisdom for on a very daily basis and maybe on a very personal level on how to keep ourselves out of sin with things, and we need to be walking very close to Christ to hear His Holy Spirit speak to us, to let His uh, Holy Spirit teach us the law of God in our hearts so that we might hear Him. Um, sometimes Christians like a whole bunch of standards, and uh, I'm not saying standards are bad, understand, but sometimes they like a whole bunch of standards, a whole bunch of rules which tell them this is right, this is wrong, so they don't really have to particularly worry about knowing God very closely. So they can just kind of do what they want. As long as they keep the rules, they're a good Christian. Well, that's not true Christianity. True Christianity is all about knowing Christ. Um, the Bible says, the, the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And what you need is the power of the Spirit of God actively inside of you to, to, uh, to restrain sin. Um, all the laws there were in the world didn't stop you from being a sinner before you were saved. They only condemned you. They pointed you to Christ. They showed you that you were a sinner. Now that you are saved, and if indeed you are, if you're not saved, today is the most important time for you to believe and for you to understand that you are. But now that you are saved, all the laws in the world won't keep you out of sin either. But listening to the Holy Spirit sure will. Obeying the Word of God will. But understand that. Um, Sometimes we like to have a set of rules we have and we think we're a good person because we keep those rules. And if we think we're a good person because we keep a set of rules, we have uh, basically replaced the work of the Spirit of God with a, the work of our own mind. And that's something we need to all be very careful about. But uh, it's interesting how Paul talks about knowing Christ. It's a very personal relationship Paul has with Christ. And I hope... Whenever you give your farewell address, whensoever it may be, you don't know when it is, and I don't either. 
But I hope if you were to consider at that point, it would be that you uh, have been walking in Christ and you know him. And that you're loving for him more than for anything. And that he's the most important thing for you. Um, it's more than just knowing Christ like, uh, say, um, knowing a set of roads or something. Charlie knows literally every road in Miami, probably. Um, it, but knowing Christ is not like knowing roads. I know um, there's this one mountain I wanted to climb in Colorado, Mount Elbert. I studied for probably two years the exact route up the mountain. It's not complicated either. There's signs on the trail. But I studied it over and over and over again, looked and poured over pictures. First time I tried climbing it, I failed. The second time, I finally got to the top of it. And um, I can, in my mind, picture the entire way up the mountain. And whereas I could say that I know Mount Delbert, that's not life-changing to me. It really doesn't change anything. It really doesn't do anything in particular. Um, knowing Christ is a relationship with a person not with a set of rules, not with laws, but with something which actually changes your life and writes the laws of God in your heart. When we love Christ as we ought, it helps us not to sin because we don't want to trouble Christ. We don't want to hurt Him. We don't want to offend the Holy Spirit in us. When the Holy Spirit says, no, that that's something sin, when we love Him as we ought, we don't want to do it because we don't want to sin against Him. See, this is the difference between uh, walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit. The Galatians, they were walking in the flesh because they wanted to have just the laws of Israel over them. Walking in the spirit is so much more than that. It is God in your heart changing your heart to do the things which are written in the law anyway in the first place. But when we do a law because we want to, when we keep a law because it's written in our hearts, it's a completely different thing than keeping a law because it's written on something we're looking at. Understand it is so important for you to walk close to God because if you do not walk close to God, you can have a whole set of rules and inside just be a burning shell. You ever heard of pastors committing adultery? Happens. Ever heard of godly men who did terrible, terrible, awful things? King David did. Pastors today do. All kinds of people do. Why do they do that? How could it happen? That one night they uh, uh, fall in, uh, walk, step outside the door and fall into a pit which was labeled adultery? Did they draw a card from the deck and it said, Today you steal $1,000 from the church? They stopped walking close to Christ. They didn't seek to know him. And that's why pastors fall. That's why Christians fall. It's because they stopped knowing Christ. They still have every single rule they used to have. Every single one of them. But the laws didn't change anything. But Christ in you and knowing Christ will change you. And you must walk in him. You must know him. If you are going to finish your course with joy, you must know Christ. And uh, this is what he says. Um, this is Paul saying, not as though I had already attained. Paul saying, and this is Paul writing towards the end of his life, your book of Philippians. If I understand correctly from what Bible scholars have said, and if they understand correctly, he had maybe about two, three years left to live after this. Not as though I had already attained. Paul says he's not already perfect. Nor, or either we're already perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Paul says he's not yet there, he hasn't yet arrived. And if Paul, who wrote a lot of the New Testament, hasn't yet arrived, we haven't yet arrived either. Paul had to grow still to his last day, and so do we. And uh, so, each time we make a point of spiritual growth, each time you make a point of spiritual maturity, uh, watch out to, against backsliding, shore that point of growth up, um, if you will. Uh, every time you decide you're going to live for God, understand that it can't just be that one moment. It has to keep growing. It has to be a daily thing. We partake of food daily, so we must partake of the bread of life and the water of life daily. Uh, the Bible says, pray without ceasing. Even as we breathe without ceasing, so we ought to be in Christ without ceasing. And this is what he says in verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Apprehend, well, the apprehend. You ever heard of apprehending a criminal? Um, but Paul hasn't yet got where he's trying to get to, is what he's saying. Um, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, the things which are behind you, there's victories in your past, and if you rely on your past victories to give you present victory, you'll fail because you're not relying on Christ. You'll eventually wind up not serving Him the way you're supposed to. 
Um, if you rely on your past defeat, sometimes people have been defeated badly in the past or they've had very bad uh, hardships in the past. Sometimes there's things happen to people that are really hard for them to get over. And uh, those things need to be gotten. Uh, we can't allow those things to, to hold us back anymore either. Sometimes there's some Christians who've been very badly offended by things pastors have done or things godly Christians have done. No one's perfect, remember, or sometimes things the church has done. They're very, very badly offended by something someone said or did. And uh, maybe they have very legitimate cause to be offended, but we can't allow those things to hold us back from growth in Christ. Sometimes um, very great losses. Sometimes someone will lose someone who is very close and dear to them, and they'll never recover from that loss. And whereas in some senses I can understand that very much so, having myself lost uh, uh, very close family members, uh, lost a sister already, and others. Um, there comes a point where we need to serve others also, and if we dwell only on the past loss, you cannot serve others in the future and in the present. So, the past is the past. It's done, it's gone. You can't change it, but you can change today. You don't know what tomorrow will be, but you can change today, and today you can reach for that mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So here's that prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That is, that's what God has called you to do. God has called each of us to a particular service. And uh, each of us have that course, if you will, that race we're supposed to run. Each of our races is, uh, is, is unique. Each of, none of us have the same calling, if you will. None of us have the same course we're supposed to run. Everybody, on, like when you have track and field, you know, everybody has kind of the same course they run around. Well, Christians don't necessarily have the same calling, all of them. The Bible talks about we're all one body, but we're all many members. Each of us is called to a specific service, to a specific ministry, to a specific aspect to serve Christ, to a specific people to serve and to work with. And so each of us need to press on toward that calling toward uh, which God has called us to. If you've had great success in the past, go ahead and forget about it. Today's different. If you've had great failure in the past, if you've tried to serve Christ and it just didn't work for some reason, if something went wrong, forget about that too. If something terrible happened, forget about that. That's the past. Press on toward Christ today. And uh, anyway, so Paul talks about finishing his course with joy. Something he says here at the end of this chapter in Philippians, though, he says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you now often, and tell you even weeping, that they are now the enemies of the cross of Christ. Who's this? This is Christians who became the enemies of the cross of Christ. And their, their end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from... Whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like in his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Our life is to be lived to the glory of God, and sometimes we find things in life which set themselves in opposition to the glory of God. And due to the lust of the flesh, the lust of our eyes, and the pride of our life, we, we desire things in this life, and because we don't want anyone telling us what to do, we don't want God telling us what to do or man, we end up sinning. Sometimes we can make ourselves in opposition to Christ. And uh, basically what it's saying here, whose end is destruction, isn't talking about Christians going to hell. What this isn't talking about anything like that. Um, what it's talking about is, um, well, our sins do destroy us, honestly. Christians who sin... Their sin causes them problems. It, it's true. And um, their glory is in their shame. Um, the things you were saved out of, the sins, now after you become a Christian, Christians still have sins, and uh, all Christians sin, but the things you've gotten victory over, if you go back into them, if you glory in those shameful things you once had victory over, that, that's, that's a bad thing. And this comes when we mind earthly things. Um... Uh, Book of Colossians tells us, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. So love Christ and love the things of God. Don't let the things of earth call you into sin. Know Christ and seek to know him. Love him above all else. Anyway, um, back to the Apostle Paul. So he uh, basically, what he said is he, he uh, 
He didn't count none of those things which have moved him. Like I said, he forgot the things which are behind. He uh, knew that ahead of him was was uh, was trials in Jerusalem. Behind him was a great many trials and afflictions too. Paul had already endured all kinds of things at this point in his life. This is Acts chapter 20. It's uh, toward the end of the book. Most of the rest of the end of the book, Paul is in prison. He knows that's coming. Uh, a lot of the time before this, he's been in prison or he's been beaten. He's been stoned. He's had all kinds of problems and all kinds of things have happened to him, but none of these things move him. Anyway, he goes on to say, Now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take to you record this day that I am pure of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. So here Paul, he, Paul uh, has an advantage, an advantage over many of us. Paul knows that he's not going to see them anymore. So he has a special farewell address unto them. We don't know when we're all going to die, and we don't know what uh, changes life may have all for us ahead. So it's important to take the opportunities we have, opportunities to preach the gospel to the lost. The Bible says, As ye have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. When God gives you an opportunity to bless your brothers and sisters in Christ, take that opportunity. Um, when we have opportunity to be a blessing to our family, our earthly families, and uh, to help them, it's very important for us to take that opportunity. God put you in the family he put you in on earth for you to be a ministry to that family. No one can reach your personal family better than you. No one can be a better blessing to them than you can. And uh, no one can help them to live for Christ more than you can in many ways. And I know it's often hard because of it to reach family members in a lot of ways, but um, no one knows them like you do. I know when you're trying to reach family members, there's things you've done to them wrong in the past which hurt them. Like, uh, I can think of times some of my siblings had done some things which were wrong and I was trying to help them with them. They are saying, well, you did this in the past, and so they know my past and they know your past. Sometimes what they really need is for us to love them and to see beyond the wicked spot they're at and have hope for them to be better than the wicked place they're in. And... Um, we don't know how much longer we have with all these things, but we do know that it's important for us to be uh, basically, in this case, Paul was talking about preaching the gospel to the lost, but to take the opportunities we have to reach the lost around us and the saved. Um, this is an interesting warning here Paul gives to the people. He's leaving them at Ephesus behind. Uh, he is departing to Jerusalem. This is what he says. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So he's talking to pastors here, but there is application to us too. Each of us have uh, some area of service God has called us to, and it's important to find a part of service in the church. It's important for you to take heed to that part of service God has called you to and to fulfill that service and uh, to... Uh, to minister in the church of God, as it's saying here, which he has purchased with his own blood. This is something very important and precious to Christ. So it's important for us to be active servants in our churches. And um, we're not all pastors and these sort of things. And uh, we're not all Sunday school teachers. And not all can preach and not all can teach. And not all have the same calling, but all have some calling and all ought to be faithful in that calling to which they are called. But then he goes and says this, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So Paul knows he's going to leave, but Paul knows that evil people are going to come in to destroy the flock. Why does a wolf attack a flock of sheep? On the right path. Or for what? Because they're on the right path, something like that. So, well, kind of. Okay, when a wolf attacks sheep, the wolf attacks him because he's hungry. Wolves attack sheep or whatever. They want to feed on them. They want to eat them. Sometimes cats attack things. Uh, I remember, there's the weirdest thing I read about. This is here in the state of Florida happened. There's an island. You know, there's a lot of islands off the west coast of Florida. There's a small island. These people had a small island. They lived on the island. They raised monkeys on the island. And uh, I think they sold them to zoos whatnot. They had, I think, 27 <laughs> monkeys. Anyway, um, they had two big guard dogs on the island. Uh, 
I think they're German Shepherds, two really big guard dogs. Anyway, they're 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 asleep. <clears throat> One night they hear the most terrible sound coming from their monkeys. See, the monkeys roamed free on the island because it was a really small island, and it was well enough separated from the mainland the monkeys couldn't swim across and get loose. So the last thing we need is invasive monkeys in South Florida. <laughs> anyway, um, we have enough with boa constrictors, pythons. We don't need invasive monkeys. Anyway, terrible noises from the monkeys. They they uh, they don't know what to do. They let the dogs out, and hopefully that'll scare off whatever it is, because you know really big dogs. You know it was salt water, so it wasn't alligators, um, and they were far enough north. I think it wasn't crocodiles to worry about either. So uh, anyway, the dogs come back in, and after a couple minutes, they're all cut to pieces, tore up. So the people were smart enough; they weren't going to go out. If what it was got the dogs, they weren't going to go out either. So they go out outside themselves later, and uh, well, they found panther tracks all on the thing, and they found 27 dead monkeys. Not a one of them was eaten. Don't feel bad for the monkeys, they're invasive species. Um, <laughs> anyway, so 27 dead monkeys. The mother panther was teaching her daughter how to kill. Uh. Cats do those kind of things. Wolves don't. Wolves just eat stuff because you know, wolves are much, dogs are much more noble animal than cats anyway. That's what that all goes to show, is dogs are much more noble than cats. If you're a cat lover out there, don't take any offense. It's not meant to. It's just kind of a thing. I, I like dogs better than cats, um, partly because I had this one cat named Tommy and ran away when I was four, and it's built long bitterness ever since from them. Um, I don't off Have I ever told you about Tommy before? That's often because I repressed the memory. He was a little orange cat, now that I think about it. And he ran away one day. Anyway, so... But here's these wolves. They're entering in the flock of God for their own personal gain. They are pretending to be something they're not. Sometimes they're lost people pretending to be saved. Sometimes they're saved people pretending to lead people closer to Christ, pretending to be dis people who disciple others to Christ. But they're just trying to gather a following. They're maybe trying to get financial gain. Uh, there are some people who are pastors for money. Um, uh, or they're like... Um, uh, there's this guy who comes on TV at 4 in the morning in the hospital and he goes on and on about send me your money and God will bless you. It's just the most ridiculous thing but somehow people send him money. I guess at 4 in the morning you're susceptible to almost anything. But um, uh, there's that guy Joel Osteen out in Texas. Um, he is very financially wealthy. There's a bunch of different people. They're very, very wealthy and so if you play your cards right you can get really, really rich and the ministry of the gospel, although it's probably not the ministry of the gospel at all anymore at the point in which you're getting fabulously wealthy. Um, it's not bad for pastors to be well taken care of to their church, but a pastor who's multiplying himself gold, silver, and precious stones on this earth is not really following what Christ and his followers did. Um, there were some, like Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich man, and he did serve Christ. There's nothing wrong with a believer being rich. But if someone uses the ministry of Christ for their own personal enrichment, they are, uh, they are uh, straying from its purpose. Anyway, so there's these wolves. They enter in. And also of your own selves shall men arise. Here's people who they themselves are walking right. And Paul says, if you don't watch out from you, your own selves, people will arise. Some of you here who sit in this room today could yourself become a wolf against the flock of God one day. And don't think, well, that could never be me, because it could be. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. If you act toward your own good instead of the good of the brothers and sisters in Christ, if your decisions you make in church are for your own benefit, not for the benefit of others, watch out. You could be growing to the point where you destroy the flock of God. So don't live for yourself. Live for Christ. Live to bless others. So it says, Of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things, that's twisting things, they take the truth of the scripture and they twist it so it'll benefit them instead of bless others. And instead of lead others closer to Christ, they twist the truth, and it says this, to draw away disciples after them. Uh, sometimes some speakers will be very motivational, very inspirational speakers, and super good at creating a following. Be careful about some speaker who's got a really good following. People who are super excited about what he says, but then really afterwards can't tell you exactly what he said but they know they really were inspired by him. Be careful about those kind of leaders. Careful about their books. Be careful about people who say a lot but say nothing. 
Be careful about people who are really good at getting you to like them. Be very careful of these people. Anyway, Paul also goes on to tell these people, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to mourn everyone, night and day with tears. Why Paul is finishing his course with joy is because he's invested into it. He's invested a lot into the work of the ministry. He, he uh, spent his three years there in Ephesus, building these people up to be a godly people. It meant, really meant a whole lot to him. Uh, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Uh, the work of the ministry should be an emotionally invested ministry. If you love and care about things, it should mean more than just uh, on a rational level to you. It should uh, actually affect your heart and uh, your love for things. Um, and he says here now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Remember about those wolves? Paul didn't do what he did for gain. Be careful about someone who's trying to get uh, money out of you. Be careful about people who are trying to make a gain off of you. Like I said, it's not the pastor shouldn't be paid. The Bible says they that preach the gospel ought to live with the gospel. Um, and these sort of things. But what I'm saying is be careful. There are grievous wolves and they like to build a following and they like to get your money. Be careful about them. Ye, yea, you yourselves know that, that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. Now, Paul himself worked. Not all pastors are supposed to do that. But Paul himself worked for his own needs and uh, to take care of the needs of those who were with him. Paul, it appears, made tents. That's what a lot of people think he did. I'm not sure if that's what he did or what. But somehow he had some kind of work he did to take care of himself. And that was in many ways he did that so no one could say that Paul did what he did for money. Sometimes people like to twist this and say, well, pastors shouldn't ever be paid to do the work of the ministry. Well, that's not biblical. We'll find out about that in 2 Corinthians and stuff. But um, uh, people like to do that. Here's why. Some people like to do that because they like basically to destroy the authority God puts in a pastor and uh, they don't want someone telling them what to do. They say, well, churches shouldn't have full-time pastors. Everybody should all be equal. Shouldn't be someone over the flock of God. Well, God does put elders over the flock, overseers, is what he calls them in this passage of also. And elder, think of an elder sibling leading his, his, his other siblings. Especially in this or, more oriental culture, after the parents would die, the oldest brother would have responsibility over his siblings to, to take care of them in these kind of things and lead them in many ways. That's kind of an idea, an, an older family member someone who's leading because of that, an overseer, and a, uh, someone who's directing them. So they're supposed to be pastors and these kind of things. Don't let grievous wolves tell you there's not supposed to be. And I have shown you all these things, how still laboring ye ought to support the weak, and how to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. How not to be a wolf? Well, one way is to give to others and to be a blessing to others. Uh, don't live for your own gain, but live to give others gain. And that's how one way not to be a grievous wolf in the flock. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And uh, it says, They all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorry the most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him under the ship. The next passage goes on to talk about how Paul goes to Jerusalem. Paul gets in big trouble in Jerusalem. Book of Acts concludes with Paul ending up basically awaiting judgment in Rome. Anyway, the apostle Paul lived his life and he finished his course with joy. And I hope that you will finish your course with joy also. You don't know when your farewell message will be, and uh, you're not sure what it'll come to, but um, I'd like to earnestly, eagerly encourage each of you to live for Christ. Uh, this morning is the last time I'll, I will be addressing you for perhaps a very, very long time. Uh, this is, in a sense, my farewell sermon. Kathleen and I have been called elsewhere. We're moving to Colorado as of next week. So, um, we uh, will be missing you all, and um, whereas I don't consider myself at all the Apostle Paul, I do consider myself to have been someone who's ministered here and who uh, hopefully has been a blessing to others. And um, in many ways, I haven't done everything I ought to have done and haven't done the things I 
have done things I should not have done and have not done things I should have done. And so forgive any wrong I may have done. But um, I hope to have been a blessing to you all, and I hope now that as I am leaving, anything I have done previously in the church, you will step up and do, and then more, the more so also. Um, it is my earnest hope that um, many of you who are in this room here will uh, continue to grow and live for Christ, perhaps become Sunday school teachers in this church. We need, uh, the church needs to grow. We need to eventually um, get uh, more children's workers. We need uh, more adult workers. We need all kinds of things here in this church. And um, there, uh, there are many opportunities for growth, many chances for it. I hope you, that uh, you seek them out and take them. And um, as I said, um, I will be missing you all. But I'll be seeing all of you in heaven, I hope. If you have not yet believed in Christ, if you're trusting in your works or in your church membership and these kind of things, unfortunately, goodbye is goodbye forever. And not only from my face, but from the face of God. Um, unfortunately, uh, sin separates us from God, and uh, sin is very destructive to us. It's destructive to Christians, and it's destructive to the lost. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So I encourage you, if you've never trusted in Christ, to believe in him today. Those of you who have trusted in Christ, I encourage you to finish your course with joy. You don't know how much longer you have ahead of you, so uh, now you need to live for Christ. Don't put off to the future for what you ought to do. Uh, start reading your Bible daily. If you don't already, start praying, spending time in prayer daily. Start walking in prayer, learning to listen to the Holy Spirit's leading and teaching to you. Don't put these things off to the future. Don't start actively living for Christ for the future because the future is of a very uncertain point. You don't know when the end is. Uh, Lord, teach us to number of days that we may apply our hearts on the wisdom, the book, by, uh, the book of Psalms says in Psalm 90. So um, I encourage you that you would live your life for Christ. And um, that if I do not see you again on this earth, and I'll be back here t tonight, I'll be back uh, next Sunday night also, not next Sunday morning, but I'll be back uh, next Sunday night. And that'll be our final service here. We'll be leaving thereafter. I encourage you, if I don't see you again, that when I see you in heaven, I will hear that you lived for Christ and that your life did mean something. And there will be people in heaven because of the life you lived and because of the testimony for Christ you bore. And uh, so I hope these things for you, and I hope that in heaven you will have great treasure and great reward because of your faithful service to Christ in this church or wherever God so may call you. Anyway, um, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and we'll be uh, concluding our service here. Dear God, thank you for your word, for the many good things you've given us, and um, the opportunities to service to me and Kathleen here at this church for your opportunities you've given each of us to live for you, that you love us and you've trusted us to the, us the uh, word of reconciliation. I pray that we would take this ministry to heart and that we would uh, live for you with all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we'll be concluding our service here with invitation. Turn to hymn uh, 246. Um, we'll go ahead and play, sing it without the piano. Uh, hymn 246, we'll all stand uh, the song softly and tenderly. Um. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Oh.
waiting for you and for me. Why should we linger and heed not his mercies? Mercies for you and for me. Come home. Come home. sincerely and to hold nothing back. Help us please to love you and to serve you to set our affections on things above. In Jesus' name, amen. We're dismissed.